Uh, my name is Stuart Lear, USPTA professional and uh, state president from Massachusetts. Welcome to the from chess checkers to chess understanding advanced strategy and pickleball session with Phil Heyman. Uh, Phil is a USPTA elite professional and a IPTPA level two professional, as well as being certified in PTR and PPR. Phil is currently the director in tennis and pickleball for the Hingham Mass Rec Department. I would like to welcome my fellow USPTA state president, Phil Heyman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And, you know, welcome to uh, some understanding more of strategy in pickleball. And one of the things that's happening, as we all know, is that pickleball is quickly morphing to, into a game of power and all court defensive skill and necessity. So, and like tennis, where, you know, the game is played in a bigger area or it's or thus more spatial in pickleball it's much closer quarters and it's more it's played much closer to the ground and so therefore you know players are in much greater proximics to each other um, another characteristic about pickleball is that um, posture is going to play a really serious role in how a player can manage the ball so you know, keeping that in mind, a lot of a lot of pickleball at certain levels is all about unforced errors. So the first thing I wanted to really address in pickleball that in my, you know, I've been teaching for about four years now. And um, one of the things that I'm noticing right away is that, you know, rating players has become, you know, a major issue globally. Okay, but especially in the US. And so one of the things that I am trying to convey to my, my constituents is that, you know, there's going to be different layers of pickleball. And I like to break them down into four categories. So people who've never picked up a paddle, they may not be athletic, um, or have just have no experience with pickleball. That's a novice level, okay? So inexperience is the key there. Then you have some people who've learned how to play, maybe not taken a clinic or done any lessons, or, you know, they could be athletic and they're just going out and hitting the ball. But, you know, not a lot of exposure. They may know how to keep score. They may know some components of the game. These are the, the recreational players. And as you, as, as you know, that's a big category. Then my third, my third category is what I call, is what I call the competitive level. Now, these are the people who've, you know, have been involved for a while in pickleball and started taking clinics, do drill sessions, go to camps. So a lot of these folks, and, and again, this, this category, it, it, enlarges weekly these are the players who are you know want to go to tournaments want to play in ladders they want to do things competitively and finally that fourth that fourth category is the pro level which obviously and some of us saw the u.s pro that was just this past week the week last week and um there was some good pickleball there was some average pickleball the best pickleball i saw was not the pro level in that it was more it was more relatable to the players who were in that competitive level. So I mean the senior categories, the, the 30, the 30 categories, the, all those categories are more exciting. So one of the things that is happening in pickleball, and I'm gonna what I'll be addressing is more the in the strategy going from the recreational level to the competitive level. And one of the things, so let's talk about first the basic strategies. And this is, again, this will be for the recreational level. Number one point that you want to make, or I'd like to say you want to make, is keep the ball down. I mean, you don't want any balls sitting up. 
um, you want to be in synchronization with your partner. Now, very important because you just have to work as a pair in such a small area. Um, you need timely communication, okay? Um, I see it all the time. People are just, you know, looking at each other and shots go by them. So we're going to clear up that confusion. And finally, you're working on positioning, okay? Now, that holds for the recreational level, for the competitive level. So that's where the checkers, that's where the basic strategies are right there. And you can teach that. And it takes a while for even those basic strategies for, for that recreational level to sink in. Again, they're out there a lot of times to have fun. They're just hitting the ball. Um, it's very random. When we move into the competitive level, random is out the window. So um, one of the first things that you, uh, you see on this, your screen is what I call, in this, in this illustration, it's called blocker workhorse. You can call it anything you like. I like to call it, I like to call it the terminator and the grinder. The grinder being the workhorse, the terminator being the blocker. As you can see, there's like a little, there's like, you can see like a, a headlight type image coming from the blocker. This area right here is what the blocker is covering. They have what we call the little V, okay? You can see it's that light colored little V section. Now, look at the dark blue section, okay? And I hope everyone can, can distinguish between the lighter blue and the darker blue. The darker blue is what I want you to focus on. I call this the big V, okay? This is the grinder or you can call it the producer. Again, you guys can name them whatever you like, but notice, look at the much bigger area that they, they're responsible for. So when you're talking blocker and workhorse, all right, this is where you the, com the, the competitive level has to understand this because this strategy is gonna help you be able to, you know, communicate and clearly know your responsibilities on the court. So let's talk about the blocker. If you notice the blocker, that V is responsible for their th for a third of the co court, a third. Whereas the producer or the, gr or the grinder, they're responsible for two thirds. And you can see right now in this illustration that the workhorse is a little offset or a little bit behind the blocker. Okay. I'll use these names. I, I, I use different names, but we'll use these names. Okay. And there's a good reason for that, which I'll explain later. So right now you're looking at court club coverage based on the, where the ball is. Okay. So some of the key strategies in this formation, okay. You want to defend first attack second. What that means is, you know, the workhorse who could be the receiver, obviously in the serve, you know, if, if, the, if the balls hit cross court, they would be the workhorse. And the <laughs> ball there, obviously that person is going to have to hit a ball that's going to allow them time to get in. The blocker, it, this, this illustration shows the blocker already moved in. So the workhorse has already hit the second shot and is starting in. Okay, we'll get back to that. That's not important now. The, the important thing is that you understand you defend first, attack second. If your defense is, you know, is together, your offense will take care of itself. Next thing you want to look at here is you want to get in, in a situation where it's two against one. One per person is hitting, two people are ready to defend. Okay, so your, your partner hits a shot, you're thinking defense next or defending. And I'm not talking about defending against the shot. I'm, I'm talking about covering area, okay? Um, you want to be able to share coverage over 100% of the court. So, for example, right now, the workhorse is in the back, just in back of the blocker, okay? So, guess what? they're going to cover anything that goes over the blocker's head. 
Obviously, if the blocker was up to the NVZ line and the workhorse was a little closer, they would still be responsible for anything that goes in the blocker because that falls within that shaded area for the workhorse. Okay, so this makes it clear from the beginning as a pair what your responsibilities are. This is really, really important. This has worked well for me. Those people coming out of that recreational level and the competitive level, they have to understand this. And this is the underpinnings for, from, from the competitive level to the pro level. Obviously, obviously, there's going to be some deviations and situations and strategy changes based on what you see on the other side of the net. But this, this is fundamental right here, guys. Now, next, another strategy that you want to be aware of Again, here at the competitive level is these lines, these lines are not barriers to your movement. Okay, they're not barriers. They're here for one thing, to identify different parts of the court, but they're not barriers. The only line that you can say might be a barrier, maybe, is the NVZ line, the non-volley zone line, or kitchen line. Us as Hello. professionals, as time goes on, you still may want to use kitchen, but I found that a lot of times, especially at the recreational level, kitchen doesn't mean a lot to people. It doesn't mean a lot. It just means, okay, kitchen. If you say non volley zone, they start thinking right away. So be mindful that, yeah, it's hard to get away from the kitchen rhetoric, but I suggest that you, you start adopting more of calling this the non-volley zone and the non-volley zone or NVZ line. So that NVZ line might be the only barrier that you can actually say that line may make you hesitant, maybe, okay? But the rest of these lines are not, they're not, they don't impede you from moving anywhere on this court, okay? Because that's, that's the one thing I really, you're free to move wherever you, when it, when, whenever you can, okay? Now, the other thing is, three is a magic number in pickleball. What I mean by that, you have three different kinds of shots, okay? Or three directions, we'll put it that way first. You have straight ahead, you have, which would be, let's say, blocker, blockers. If you were hitting straight ahead, that would be blocker to blocker. Or if you're hitting cross court, that's another direction. That's workhorse to workhorse. So you can see a blocker. If you're hitting vertical, you guys would be designated as blockers. If you're hitting cross court, all right, you're designated as workhorses. All right. So the whole idea of this right now is, is that you want to be able to hit in these three different directions, straight ahead, cross court, and that third direction, down the middle, okay, down the middle. Those are the only three directions that you can hit in pickleball, okay. Then there's also three different kinds of spin, okay. Obviously, top spin, under spin, side spin, all right. And the last series of threes, okay, and again, you have what we, what we say, you have three different shots you can hit. You can hit a dink. And again, I, dink and kitchen, these are words that, and us as tennis pros, these words are kind of foreign to us, but drop sure is not. So I use drop, and drop is being more used universal in the pickleball world anyway, because of the invasion of tennis players and tennis pros into the world of pickleball, okay? So the whole idea here is you have a drop shot, you have a drive shot, and you have a lob. So it's a game of threes, guys. And your students understand this. Again, it gives them a much more greater understanding and a big picture of what this game is all about and gives them a little more direction right away. So the whole idea, again, is, is you're defending first, attacking second, okay? Now, let's do this now. So 
if you have the next thing I want to talk about are the zones. Okay. All right, let's expand this. Okay, so if you see if you see this diagram now, we'll start at the baseline. So no longer is this called the back line. Again, it's adopting more of, of tennis terminology. So you can see where the defense where the defense is. This shows it, okay, behind the baseline, but actually, I don't like this 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 diagram, which I didn't draw up. I but I should have I, I should look closer. Defense is all of the area. If you look at, can everyone see my cursor? Everyone's muted. Okay, using my cursor from here all the way back is the defensive area. All of this, all of this is defensive. Okay, so this area in here, this is the no man's land. This is no man's land of the defense of the defense sector. Okay, obviously the next, the next layer of the court positioning, is the transition area, and finally offense. Okay, so one of these things. You know, you have different responsibilities based on based on where you're at. Um, so in the defense area, you're just trying to put a ball. So two things can happen here from here: a third shot drop or a third shot drive. Pretty self-explanatory. You know what what players can you do back here? Lobbing from back here at the competitive level. It's rare, not unless you've come from the offensive zone and came back to hit a, a defensive lob, okay? So you're not looking at lobbing from this area. So you basically, of those three shots, you can hit two of those shots from here, all right? Transition area. This area in pickleball, which this is not no man's land. This is a, the, probably the most important part of pickleball right in here. So much happens in this area. So this area is an offense defensive area, all right? And what you do here determines how you get up to the offensive area, which is what? That is the NDZ line, okay? And if you notice this NDZ line, okay, so I'm sorry, excuse me, because this offensive area is not an NDZ line. It's a little area here. And again, I don't quite like, this area is where a lot of times you step back, you'll see people step back from the NVZ line and hit drop shots. But if you're moving back, it's because you want, you have time to move back into this offensive area because up at the NVZ line forward is the attack area. So you're right here. So right in here, from here up, all this, because obviously there's your net. This whole area, the NVZ zone, is where you're attacking. Now, when I say attack, you're not getting balls that are necessarily sitting up here. When you're attacking here, you're mainly focusing on placement here. Keeping dinks low, keeping dinks, or you may go for a spot that you're attacking. Being in concert with the blocker or the workhorse, depending on what you're doing. You're always playing for your partner. You have to play with your partner. You work, you have to work with your partner. In pickleball, and I'm not saying that it, it happens in tennis, but you, we all know as tennis pros that a lot of times, sometimes people disappear. Your partner disappears on the court. It's not that they're hiding. They just disappear a little bit. In pickleball, impossible. Impossible. The space is just too small. So you always need to be aware of what your partner, where your partner is, because that's going to dictate which shot you're going to hit. Okay? So these are the zones. And very important that your students understand what, what, what they can do. Obviously, this is going to define more how you build your students' skill sets and once they come to the competitive level, how valuable that technique or those skill sets are.
because you've got to be able to do a lot of things in all these areas. Okay. One other thing I'd like to do, I'd like to grid, I'd like to grid off the NVZ zone or the NVZ, the, the non-volley zone, excuse me. So if you start at the net post and you do go in threes again, so from here to here would be zone, zone box one, box two, box three. So box three is right at the center line next to the net. Then you count, the, then the next three squares back would be four, five, six. Same thing on this side. One, two, three, four, five, six. The reason why, we, why you grid off this area, guys, is because if you hit certain shots in certain zones, in the non-volley zone, there's only certain things, there's certain areas where you should be hitting that ball. And also, in that way, your partner is going to be know if you hit, if that ball lands in that area, what they can expect back to this side. So, for example, if a ball brings you in, if a ball brings you in to these front three boxes, obviously you're you're compromised in that you're in the in the in the non-volley zone. You've got to hit a shot that gives you time to get out of there. All right, and if it falls on this side, if it falls on this side, then that means that you've got to hit a shot that allows you, depending on what you see over there, to get back and not compromise your partner, okay? So there's a lot to this gridding, and you know this can be explained more in detail, but you know I, I wanna make sure that everyone understands that this area, you've got to be able to hit different shots. Obviously, let's say you have a cross-court exchange. The workhorses are hitting back and forth. And this is one of the things about changing directions in pickleball. You don't want to change directions unless you get a ball or you see a situation on the other side that allows you to do that. Sometimes, let's say, for example, you know, your opponent, you hit a ball to zone. This is zone six. Okay, your partner hits a low, you hit a low ball to the workhorse on the opposite side. They get it back to zone one. There's no way that you're going to go down the line here. So you now have to hit another ball that's going to give you time to recover and for your side to recover from that shot. Okay, so there's a cat and mouse, there's a cat and mouse game that goes on all in this zone. Okay. But the whole idea is, you know, there's a lot of movement and strategy. So now that you have a little more background, and again, I can, you know, you, you can ask questions, you know, at any time about this blocker workhorse concept and or the zones, okay? So now, movement, movement, and strategy of movement, okay? So one of the things that, like at the U.S. Open last weekend, even at the pro level, movement, one, I saw a couple times, you know, in matches where the movement was just a little bit off, ball got a little bit high, people were in the wrong position. So one of the things that the blocker and the workhorse, what that helps you does is solidifies responsibilities and your movement is based on where the ball is. If you if you're doing well and thinking well and, and and managing the managing the shots well, there should be minimal movement on your side of the court because the whole idea is, as some of us have heard before, is trying to compromise your opponents. Compromising someone might be like pulling them out of position, getting them off balance, um, hitting shots, hitting shots to them that are hard to handle, like hitting for a righty jamming them just like in tennis jamming them where they're more defensive um you're working on compromising people anytime in any part of the court okay and they have to work on and that's where resetting comes into play which i'll explain a little bit more about that in a little more detail so here's what i'd like to do is we're going to bring i'm going to bring up a couple of videos and i want you to look 
this one, the first one you're going to see. Sorry. Sorry. Come back here. Okay, so right now, this is blockers. These are blockers. So this is one of the drills that I do right now. This is blocker to blocker. All right, I'll run this one more time just so you can see it and I'll run it in slow motion. All right, so if you see right now, look at posture. All right, and notice they should be trying to volley as much as they can up there. Some of them are hitting half volleys. If you have your opponent hitting half volleys, you've already compromised them to a degree. So right now, what I instructed these guys to do is they're simply trying to move each other around. They're trying to move each other around as blockers. So, and when you're dinking straight ahead like this, very, very important because really, remember what I call the blockers. They're the attack people. These are the people that are looking to attack. Okay, so one of the big things at this level is poaching. Poaching is a big deal in, in pickleball at the competitive level because if a workhorse is doing their job, the workhorse is the quarterback, they're trying to set up the blocker who's looking to poach or attack at any time. The blocker's main responsibility is to protect is to protect down the line, okay? They're not worried about, and I'll talk about the workhorse in a second. So if I move up a couple frames, okay, I'm stopping right here. So postures are pretty good. Obviously this person's missed a ball right here, but I like what they're doing right now. I don't see any back swings, you know, and they're moving the ball around, okay. So I'm gonna to go to another, I'm gonna to go to the next video. And you're gonna see in this one where the workhorse comes in. Okay, they started out. So this is workhorse to workhorse. Notice the movement of the blockers. All right, so once again, if you notice, Contact points are good. That's a little late. Half volley right there. Half volley. But at this level, half volleys are viable because a lot of people, a lot of times, have pretty good hands at this level. Okay. Back to cross court. That was in zone, that was in zone one. So there, there's a lot that we can be discussed here, but overview of strategy, you can see right now that these guys. They're not bad, but that ball's a ball that's set up, okay? All right, so if we go back, I'm going to go to the next one. Now we're going to get into point play. All right, in this scenario here, all right, obviously, obviously, receiver hits a deep enough serve to get into the NVZ line. They keep their opponents back on the, on the left side. And the serve side worked their way in. They didn't rush in. So once again, I'll replay this again. All right, kind of a split step, drove the ball deep. They stop, they stop in the transition area, a little defense here, nice little fifth shot drop. Now they're both in, now the game begins. So obviously the workhorses are working. So this is what I call the triangle. Both, both the blocker and the defender on the, on, on the serving side worked in a triangular fashion, that's the two-on-one effect that you've got to start using more at the competitive level. That's where the poaching comes in right there. 
So a strategy at the competitive level is you want to isolate your opponent as much as you can. That way, especially as a workhorse, you know, working with the blocker, because you want to be able to eventually, with superior drop shots, to involve the blocker more, to poach, okay? So let's exit again. All right, next video you're going to see. All right, a little different view. All right, once again here, I'll slow this down now. So there's the serve, of course. Plenty of time to get in. Now, right there, right there, the blocker on this on, on, on the near side of the court got an opportunity to hit the ball and he went after the blocker on the other side. So if I go back, let's go here, let's play. Sorry. Right there. Okay, right here. So the ball, the ball was hit from the workhorse because he's farther back and he hit it he hit it cross court to the other too high to this side so this the, per, the particular person on this side did the right shot and went to the person closest to the net that's the strategy is good however after they hit look at the posture look at their paddle his paddle is down so if we go slow his paddle's down but he doesn't get down so therefore, and I'll, again, this is where posture got him in trouble right here because technically the, he should have had this person in trouble right away. He sh that person was compromised. He hit down into the court pretty good, pretty good defense. But once again, all right, you can see coming in, bury the shot. All right, so... A lot of, as I said, a lot of unforced errors are based on posture. And in this case, this is a perfect example of posture. He doesn't, he just doesn't get down. He's hitting a half volley, okay? Now, let's go to this one. Now, let's go back. There's a lot going on in this one. So return. Okay, stop right there. Okay, let's back up just a little bit. So the first mistake here, I, I'm going to call it a mistake. Okay. Is that that this person here returned the ball to the same side he was standing on? Okay, so right away this is an issue because if we go with the blocker workhorse concept, that return should be going cross court. Okay, but instead it came to the same side. So look where the ball goes next. He hits to the workhorse. Blocker comes in, blocker's getting pounded. Good defense. So if you're back, so here's another strategy that is really important right here. Come on. right here if if you get a ball behind the blocker so this ball comes cross court that ball should be hit 
which he did. He hit the ball in, in front of his partner, and he should be closing in on that. So he hit the shot. There was no place else for him to go with this. Okay, so let me go slow again. So everyone understands this. The problem here was the closest side, he went to the, he hit the ball in front of his partner, but didn't close quick enough. He hit a pretty good dink, but hesitated. So that's not a bad point. He got beat, but again, you can't hit and, and hesitate, especially. His direction was good. However, he didn't fill space. And obviously, the blocker did not know where he was at. You need to know where your partner's at the whole time. If you can't see your partner, it's not your fault. You may have to, you, you may have to turn your head slightly, but you've got to know where your partner is. All right, so that's another video. Okay, so last clip here. This little drill right here is the offensive zone versus the transition zone. Okay, we'll go back again here. This is where a reset occurs. So my feed is going to be the reset. The reset is a ball that takes the pace off, that takes the pace off the ball, which I'm driving the ball at them. And the reset is, is simply using the right grip pressure to absorb the pace of the ball and bounce it in the no, 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 non-volley zone, excuse me. There's the bounce. Here's the close. Now we play. Ah, and obviously, did everyone see what happened here? Okay, I'm gonna go slow. Ball's too high, ball, so the workhorse worked well. Workhorse earned his keep, earned the ball that he could attack the blocker. You rarely ever attack the workhorse. You're always trying to set up to attack the person in front of you. All right, so basic strategy, there's a lot of strategy involved, but again, the difference between the recreational level and the competitive level is a lot more cerebral and it's a lot more of sharing responsibility on the court, okay? And the resetting piece is simply giving yourself time to recover or time to advance, okay? So a lot of times, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just a whole concept of getting your, you, yourselves as a pair in position, especially to that offensive position. Um, so what I'd like to say now is, is as you can see, and I feel that there's a lot more material I could go over in more detail. I didn't want to rush things or cram everything, you know, down your throat or give you this whole big file to try to, to memorize. But the biggest thing that you have to think about in this game is it's a game of offense and defense. And defense is more important than the offense. So many times the recreational people will come out, and, uh, and this is why you hear the complaints around all these complexes about the noise. Because really, these people are just banging the ball. They're just playing, they're just playing hard, hard pickleball. And the more cerebral or the more, um, we can say, polished, pickleball players, the competitive level, they're looking for opportunities. There's not banging going on a lot of the time. Because if you're banging the ball, if you bang the ball 100% of the time, you can figure 100% of the time you have potential of losing that point. So, you know, the, the big deal right now is, is that we start understanding our responsibilities as, as, as a pair. This is as a pair. This is 100% sharing of offense and defense and of court coverage. Um, 
if anyone has any questions, please hit, hit the chat. I'd be glad to answer them. I can, you know, spend a little extra time afterwards. Again, I, there's a lot of material here. These are all just overviews of all the things and but the important thing is especially some of the some of the you who are starting out and teaching the recreational level work on their skills i mean i guess it's the same as when we do the same thing in tennis You're working on the skills the thing here in pickleball is those skills everyone can pick up and you know and, and this game is advertised as being able to go out and play on a, on a, at least a fun level and recreational players, they're all about fun. But you'll soon, you know, soon people will start maybe thinking, huh, I want to take this a step further. And therefore, you have to start making sure that their that their technique, their skill, their skill set improves enough that they can go to the competitive level. So, you know, in the IPTPA, I'm a certified rating specialist. One of the things that you don't want to do as a pro is don't rate people. Don't rate them. Let them let them play because you go, oh, well, I think, you know, you might be a 3-0. A 3-0 level pickleball player, it, it, that's that's not a shoddy level. That's that's a good, solid level. I mean, a 3-0 player, the 3-5, I mean, the difference is, the difference between a 3-0 and 3-5 is the skill set. Between a 3-5 and 4-0 is strategy, all right? Once you get to 4-0, you you know you make less unforced errors and it's more about the strategy and the movement and knowing your responsibilities and shot making the pros the pros all they're waiting to do is for someone to get the ball high enough to attack hence the low ball attack so um i guess you know that's my conclusion is there should we should we take a little time out, Mike? What are we yeah. doing here? Yeah, Phil, what we'll do now is um, everybody will do the um, breakout session, uh, a quick five-minute breakout session. I just put the questions in the message to everyone. I will, uh, I'll go over them right now. The first question is, why has the game of pickleball seen a steady rise in players using power or banging the ball? And the second question is, what is the message to the server if the returning opponent hits a third shot drop back to you. All right. So what I'll do, is, uh, Mike, you're going to set up the breakout rooms. All right, great. So everybody needs to be unmuted. Hello. There we go. How's it going? How are you? Hey, Callan, how you doing? We got to get these other people to um, you. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. Oh, awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's awesome. Um, let me see if I can get these other guys. So do you have pickleball down at your, your facility? Um, we don't have pickleball in, um, you know, as far as coaching goes, but we've like kind of experimented with it a little bit. Um, there's a pretty popular club with pickleball in the area that's been pretty successful with it, but right. didn't really take at our club. Um, and I mean, we've been kind of just messing around with it a little bit with some of our like you know, four oh four five guys like after they do a like a clinic, like a group, you know, like a you know, like an hour and a half group. Um 
kind of doing it for like 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. You know, another thing is uh, pickleball is crazy up here in New England. It's just kind of took over the whole planet. And another thing, not on this here, but spec tennis is a happening thing from the West Coast. So he's going to yeah. be presenting that. So if you got those tennis people that don't play pickleball, but they go spec tennis and then you can convert them over. It's the same size court for pickleball. So you can get that. And then also those people that don't play pickle, people that do play pickleball, they don't play tennis. It's a good way to edge them into playing, you know, getting into the tennis game. So it, it works out that way. So yeah, I was, um, the first place I actually saw it was um, my wife is from Natick. Um, so, oh, nice. yeah. And I was, we were like visiting my in-laws, her, her parents, and there was a bunch of people playing this game. I was like, I, I have no idea what this is. Um, but, you know, got a sense of it and, uh, you know, obviously I've seen the popularity of it just right. over the course of the last couple of years. So that was like a couple of years back when I first saw them just like out playing in the, you know, um, at, at like a dedicated place. I can't even remember where it was. Right. Um, yeah. I asked these other people to unmute and that, so it seems like nobody wants to do it. So, <laughs> you know, or they're hidden, but, uh. Anyway, yeah, so we have a full thing of things going on here. Um, I know is um, in terms of what Phil was talking about, uh, you know, the returning, hitting the third shot, drop, you know, drop back at that third shot's a crucial. Are you certified, by the way? Did you um, do it through the USPTA, you know, with the uh, IPTPTA? Um, I know some of us have done the IFP, which is a kind of uh, upcoming. It's actually really structured in terms of what they're doing. And then some yeah. of our colleagues have done the P, you know, PTR scene. So, but uh, anyway, have you gotten certified in that? Cause you'll see that it actually enhances your kind of growing the game and, you know, different wave of kind of help promoting it, you know? Yeah. I haven't really um, been certified. I, I was looking at it as I was um, thinking of moving out of a commercial club into, you know, the, um, uh, I guess they call them, you know, private, private clubs, you know, yes. country club. Right. Um, but uh, I was I was just you know kind of on the fence about getting certified um, and obviously I'm certified through you know tennis and um, I do see the value in getting that you know elite pro rating that I have and, and whatnot but I, I just I, I don't we don't do enough pickleball yet for me right. I, I feel and I, I may maybe as it's like starting to I don't know take hold I think I'll, I'll get in, I'll get into it yeah, you know, um, once you do it, I know here in New England, um, I'm the past president, but um, anyway, I just saw everybody was like lenient about doing it. And then once they've done it, they're like, oh, my goodness, why didn't I do this a long time ago? And then mm -hmm. it's kind of more of that awareness, just like your certification now status, you know, people kind of like, you know, that credential piece. And some people are like, well, you got a lot of people thinking they know this and that, but you have that you have that clout and you understand it. And we're going to be doing a lot more of this stuff. You know, you saw the drone that Phil did and we're going to do some educational stuff. So uh, it's all good, you know, in terms of helping and help grow the game in different aspects. Not so much going about playing the tournaments, but you know, yeah. but the other thing is that training and teaching. So he's making more money. He's making more money teaching pickleball than tennis. It's unbelievable. And he is so busy and he, he, change, he charges the same amount of money. So mm -hmm. it's just met about education awareness. And I'm like, you don't see a lot of running and beating on your body either. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. True. So, but uh, yeah, there's some good stuff there. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's yeah, great. Thanks for jumping in on this here. And the other people, I don't know why they don't want to jump in, but um, all they have to do is unmute, but it's all good. So, but uh, yeah. So if we can help you anyway, in terms of being up in New England, just making a difference what region you're in or whatever, or we can give some more awareness, that kind of thing. So, cause we plan on doing some more sessions individually, kind of educating and, uh, the IFP is another one. It's um, it's uh, they have like really great video in information teaching and that part there. So, but uh, and then also pickleball, uh, USA pickleball. You know, mm -hmm. if you became a member there, they do a really thorough part, and you'll see a lot of different pieces of a lot of different people from all over. You know, um, the tournament people are pretty interesting. So, but it's good. So, but uh, cool. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a. I mean, I guess a guy who's really in it, um, you know, we played tennis in the same area and like grew up in juniors, a um, guy named Jared Chirico. He's like all over the place about it. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I do think it's a little bit more on the private side of the, um, 
you know, tennis community uh, or rackets community. Right. Um, but I do, I do see it in my, like recently um, in my neighborhood, like they converted two tennis courts and turned them into like, I don't know, I guess that's six pickleball courts or right. something like that. And they're just always full. Like, you yeah. know, the, the people are just like, you know, out there constantly. So it's obvious that it's, it's big. I just, I have to, you know, kind of work my, work my mind around it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, you know, one thing I work in a university and we were doing, we're going to be doing pickleball. They're huge. We started it last year at, I work at Harvard university and it's huge right. and we're doing spec tennis, but you know, once we get open up back in the fall, um, it's like, and, and, and we got student athletes that just love it. Give them simple rules, boom, get out there and do it. And they love it. So, but, uh, um, so I'm going to end up closing this room here so we can get back. So you can have some questions for Phil. Um, also thanks for jumping on and you got anything, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm always user. Uh, I'm, I'm actually out facilitating all these things. So I'll be around, you know, mm -hmm. so that'd be great. So, um, appreciate it. But, uh, um, yeah, and then the other sessions we have going on, you know, you're welcome to join anything. And, um, you know, you're down in Philly. We've had a few people when we had the grass court national championships at the Hall of mm -hmm. Fame. We had some people from Philly came up and uh, they loved it. They didn't want to go back. So anyway, it was <laughs> so we, uh, I think we put on a good uh, festive event too. So I think that's what they enjoyed about, you know? Yeah. So, and you teach, you work where, I know we only got a second here. Where do you work uh, at? Uh, High Performance Tennis Academy. It's in Ballackinwood. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, uh, I guess if you're, I don't, I don't know if you're, what your position is at uh, Harvard, but like I, one of my friends growing up, his sister is up there as the, the women's coach, Tracy oh, Green. Oh yeah. Tracy. I know Tracy rule. Yeah. 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 I yeah Tracy. We're tight. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're super Mike. Speaking of yeah, pickleball, so. ask her about pickleball. Ask okay. Her. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to lose you here. Sure, All right, sure. cool. Take care, Jared. See you, bud. Thanks. I think we're back on. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Mike. Hey, are you all back on? I'm back we on. Are, we are all back on. Okay. I think I was the last group. Kel, Kellen and I were getting into it because he knows Tracy Green, wanted to know if I knew her. And I'm like, yeah. And I told them that uh, I didn't get into it, but she's a big time, big pickleball player. So uh, in fact, um, anyway, we've been sneaking behind the scenes. I didn't say that, but sneaking behind the scenes playing some pickleball. So she's a good player. So anyway, we're going to get him on board. So um, good. Do you, is Phil on? I'm on. All right, good. So you can do a follow up. And then um, we have um, in terms of um, pickle, uh, we have the Engage uh, Pickleball Paddle. You know, we have a get, we have a, a couple giveaways. So we'll do one gift certificate, a $15 gift certificate. And then um, we have a paddle. Actually, we're just going to do the paddle. I, uh, I threw some names out. So I think we have Jim Sharton is going to win a uh, $15 uh, gift certificate to Promise. So Jim, if you can reach back to me and, um, and give you know, send me your phone number or an email where you can contact me later. That'd be great. And, um, Phil, do you want to, you, can you see the list there? I do not. You don't see that there. Okay, so we're going to be giving that gift certificate. And then um, what we'll do is on the paddle, uh, what we'll do is we'll offer that for the, the membership meeting, and I'll have you give that out, the Engage Pickleball, uh, Engage Pickleball Paddle um, Package. So it's a paddle and some good stuff there. So you'll be on that. And that's the membership meeting is on Thursday. So... Phil, did you have any follow-up on anything that you'd like to, uh, we have four minutes, you got any little Q&A or Stu, do you want to like answer any questions here? If you can. I, have, I have nothing in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to type it out and um, put it in the chat and Stu can reach out. So if, Kellen, while you're on there, you work with high performance players. Um, I have a lot of my, my juniors. I run a high performance. I get the top two kids. You you probably saw them yesterday in New England. They all play pickleball, believe it or not. And uh, they love it. So just so you know, a little thing, you get them going. Yeah. Next thing you know, you got it happening there. Um, and we were, Phil, we were talking about the certification 
the value of the certification, uh, you know, Kellen was talking about, um, um, he was talking about the, the certification in terms of, you know, for tennis, for USBTA, but the value of the certification for pickleball de definitely enhances your uh, teaching and growing your program. Phil, do you have any comments on that? Hey, um, Phil, just one second before you go on. Everybody, I'm just uh, sharing the results of the poll questions that we shot out there. Um, are you a certified pickleball uh, teaching professional? Uh, we had 17% say yes and 83% say no. Um, you know, I, I'm going to bounce away and just interrupt Phil for a second. I became a, a certified professional and uh, this game's on the rise. I would really encourage people to uh, to pursue that if they haven't thought about it. So that's uh, that's for question number one. And then uh, let's go to question number two um, and then share results. And that was, um, uh, does your facility have a pickleball program? And 42% and, uh, was uh, yes and 63% was no. So we're seeing more facilities get them. So it's great. Thank you for uh, participating in that poll, everyone. So Phil, go ahead if you want to just close it out. Um, well, I think it's interesting. I, and I'm sure a lot of, of us as tennis teaching pros are on board with this, that my sentiment starting out with pickleball, and I started out four years ago, was, um, okay, it's, it's, it's something I had to offer both at my, my, my club, which was the Weymouth Club at the time. And we had some... Um, we had some little tennis courts and then the, the rec program I run, you know, we started doing some pickleball because of up comes the demand. And now, you know, four years later, all these people that I started out my program are now competitive pickleball players. And down here on the South shore, you know, we have, we, we obviously have the Cape and I was on the Cape at Willowbin last week. And so the pro there, uh, what's his, what's his name, Mike? Uh, Peter Gutterman. Yeah, but I mean the the tennis director there though is um, is this gentleman? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, his, his name has escaped me. But I mean, you here's a club that's all clay court, and I mean they're all clay courts, and they're um, they're implementing a pickleball program because of demand. I mean, and really it should be called Cape Florida down on the Cape because all these people escape for the winter and go down and play pickleball. That's why the Cape has more dedicated courts than any place else in New England by far, because I mean, you have people, you know, these snowbirds going back and forth. So Willowbin is implementing a pickleball program and I see that thing growing. So the facilities that can play, that can, to get pickleball and monetize it and, and as teaching pros, the way to monetize it is get certified so you're familiar with the sport, so you can do numbers. Teaching is all about numbers and pickleball. I mean, you know, to be effective, you know, I mean, you can run a clinic of eight tennis people, but we know we're scrambling, especially if it's like an intermediate clinic. Whereas an intermediate clinic in pickleball, you, you can run, you can run twelve people easily, because a lot of that is just one-on-one -on -one hitting or two-on-two, -two. and again, a lot of people their skill set develops quick enough that they can play. So, you know, I encourage people to get certified because, you know, it's a way to make some, some extra revenue and it may even, you know, stimulate you to, to even teach a little, teach a little more deeper in your tennis in the aspects of movement and deep defensive tennis. I know it's helped me a little bit. So, so if you have any questions, leave chat. I'll, I'll stay an extra few minutes. I see a couple questions. Yeah, we have a question here, Phil. Is there any connection between pickleball and table tennis? Um, a little bit, yeah, because it's a more com I mean, you know, you're taking big backstroke, big back swings or big back swings, um, you know, farther away from the table than you are closer to the table. So, yeah, I mean, in pickleball, at the NBZ line, again, you're not, you're not taking any backswing there. So I see that. I see a lot. I see a lot more badminton in pickleball than I see pickleball or than I see ping pong. 
or table tennis. Because once the ball gets high, it's coming down at you, you've got to be able to block that and reset it. And again, a reset is, so, and, and it's the same thing in, in um, to a certain extent in badminton. The ball's always coming down at you or you're trying to pop it up, you know, and pop it up where it's just arcing over and into the court, over the net. The same thing in, um, in pickleball. So um, I definitely see more badminton than table tennis. All right, Phil. So um, if we want, you, you possibly we you mentioned that uh, you have a pickleball, a USPTA New England pickleball committee. If anybody's interested in uh, being involved, maybe reach out to you. And um, the other piece is that uh, um, we will plan on probably have some more sessions or some other events later on at another time. So I don't know if you can hear me. Good thing. That's a good yeah, thing. So, um, so anyway, it's um, time here. And for those that, uh, you know, we, we may need to uh, complete this to move on. So here. No more questions? All right. Um, yeah, there's